and we are here tonight to uh, for our virtual lecture series museum mixology um, this week we're doing a sipping with science or actually sipping and slurping with uh, oysters and beer so um, if you have any questions or any if you want to make a comment go ahead and post in the chat room or raise your hand or uh, post in the Q&A um, we host this series every roughly every other week um, so we have it about twice a month um, and we all obviously cover science topics, history topics, and sometimes crime topics. So um, on that on that subject uh, of crime, um, next week's mixology is um, is going to cover terrorism in the United States. And uh, I understand it's disturbing or difficult, especially at this time in our nation's history. So I appreciate your understanding um, that this lecture series is a forum for discussion, um, but not argumentative debate. Uh, we strive to have an honest, open-minded learning experience here um, where it's safe to express differing viewpoints. So I, if you're here next week, um, I would appreciate um, that understanding. And um, also, uh, if you are here and enjoying, your, uh, enjoying the lecture or would like to hear more and as to continue the program, we always appreciate um, a donation. So you can put it in our virtual tip jar. Um, because of you, we're able to advance the cultural and educational impact of the museum. So I'll go ahead and put the tip jar in the chat room if anybody's interested. And um, I'll introduce you to Deborah Keller or, or Oyster Mom. Um, actually, she goes by Keller. So she's a career cons conservationist dedicated to sustainable oyster aquaculture. Uh, using only best management practices, o Oyster Mom is working for the future of oysters as a sustainable food source and as a habitat for the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Oyster Mom is certified by the Florida Department of Agriculture and as a certified shellfish harvester and processor selling premium farmed oysters. And if you're able to um, get some this week, uh, we had orders going out sun by Sunday. So hopefully you're enjoying some oysters and a little uh, frosty beverage while we listen to Keller um, tell us all about the oyster farming. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. I'm glad to be here. Very glad to be here. And you know, it's perfect chilly Thursday night, middle of um, oyster season, but all year round is oyster season. So I'm happy to be here and to do just a little introduction to oysters and oyster aquaculture. I'm gonna share my screen and um, we'll get started. And how does that look? Leslie, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, right. If you want to, yeah, if you want to, you can make it, um, put it in presentation mode. There you go. And we're good. Hey. Well, anyway, I am Oyster Mom. I have been farming oysters now since 2015 in the Gulf of Mexico, south of Tallahassee. And I'll actually show you where, um, where I do this, but I just wanted to get started with a little intro here. Now, everywhere I travel, people say to me, what's the finest morsel to be taken from the sea? There has to be a hundred things to make a gourmet smile. But if you want the choice I make, it's oysters by a mile. Now, some say calamari, lobsters, crabs, or even squid. And done as marinara, you'll be awfully glad you did. Or mussels laced with garlic could be your specialty. But I prefer the oyster. It's the perfect meal for me. Oh. Yep. Okay. So I hope you enjoyed that. That was given to me by the Tallahassee Beer Society, who have been loving oysters um, since I started selling them here in town and have been finding various beers that go with them quite well and making sure that people get to know those beers as well as the oyster. The oysters, like a, it's like a fine wine or a craft beer because every oyster from whatever bay it comes from gets a taste, a flavor, a maror we call it, um, of that bay. And so it's kind of interesting to pair it with a wine or with a craft beer or something that brings out the flavor of the oyster itself. So however you like to eat them, Oyster shooters, raw on the half shell, grilled, 
whatever kind of topping you'd like to put on them, drink them with champagne or wine or beer or just a Coca-Cola. They're awesome, awesome food. So I hope we have some oyster lovers here. It has been a source of protein forever. Um, I don't know who the first person was that opened up an oyster and decided it could be eaten. They were brave, of course, but particularly here in the Gulf of Mexico, we have found a tremendous number of oyster shell middens where Native American Indians were gorging, eating oysters all year round, um, and then leaving the shells and large piles right along the coastline. And we still to this day find those piles of oysters. And we, um, we've seen them now fossilized a bit. They've been around for that long. So the shells have actually become fossilized. But the Native American Indians have been farming these oysters for quite, well, since the beginning of time. And also so have our early European civilizations. When they came over from Europe, they found in the Boston Harbor and New York Harbor, Chesapeake Bay, all along the Atlantic coast, huge oyster reefs and millions and millions of oysters that also were the bedrock of our development of communities all along the coast of America. Um, as Europe over harvested their oysters and contaminated the waters around their bays and the demise of their oysters happened, we would from America send oysters back to Europe and they developed ways of transporting them um, over the sea. They also started canning them and pickling oysters and making them so they could deliver more and more oysters to Europe. And of course here in America Oysters were the food that was just consumed in, in bounty. A lot different from what I think most of us do here now with just a few dozen at a time. But um, back then it was a major source of protein. Locally, we have an incredible culture. Um, the Apalachicola oyster at one time was 10% of the entire United States oyster population oyster product, I should say. Um, it just produced a fabulous oyster. It was a career for generations of people in the Apalachicola Bay. And I'm sure many of you that are on this call have had Apalachicola oysters. They're terrific. And they were terrific because of the incredible bay ecology and the mix of fresh water and salt water. Um, coming down the Apalachicola River, and then of course the, the saltwater flush from the Gulf of Mexico. This population, this wild population has collapsed, and it's collapsed for a number of reasons, some of them starting years and years and decades ago with the shell itself becoming a product that was sold. And so instead of returning the shells to the bay, which is needed for continual oyster production, the shell was sold as road surface or tiles or whatever they were grinding it and making it into. That started part of the problem with the oyster demise. Then came the water war with fresh water being quantity being reduced coming down the Apalachicola River, the Atlanta urban center and the agricultural uses along the Chattahoochee and Flint River both decrease the amount of fresh water coming down the river and thus the amount of fresh water flush coming into the Apalachicola Bay. What that did was increase the salinity of the bay itself and that brought in additional predators that fed upon particularly the young oysters. So you didn't have that restoration of the population because of the increased predation on the oysters themselves. And then of course we had the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and that spill, the oil never made it to the Apalachicola Bay, but they thought it would. And so basically they went out at the governor's order and harvested as many of the oysters as they possibly could to get them out of the bay and to the market. Well, of course, over harvesting resulted with that effort. And then the oyster farmers were left with 
nothing to harvest. So they were harvesting as much as they could find. And many of the oysters they were finding were very, very small. We locally, we call them shorts. And um, just taking away the reproductive breeding population of the oyster itself. So many of you locally have probably read that the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, FWC has, and the fish have decided to halt all harvesting of wild oysters from the Apalachicola Bay until we can restore that population. So that's a five-year ban on harvesting. And, you know, the, the number of farmers or harvesters that have been out there has decreased from, you know, thousands down to 200, down to like 20 different people that were actually still harvesting wild oysters and the amount that they could harvest every week was reduced dramatically. So we're hoping that this rest that is being given to the bay will help to restore some of that wild population. We really need oysters in our environment. Um, this, a couple of these next three graphs come from the Nature Conservancy. I was privileged to work for the Conservancy for 29 years. I just retired in 2020. And we need oysters. It's why I started getting involved in this. They are an incredible filter feeder and filter 50 gallons a day. Each oyster is out there filtering the water. That adds to the clarity of the water, which of course adds for seagrasses and other animals to be healthy within our bays. We also, the habitat that they create, an oyster reef is not just a major nursery for everything that's going to be alive and, and functioning in our estuaries. So each oyster reef is creating the young, is, is a safe habitat for young crabs, oysters, fish, everything that's out there. And of course, then they're out in the sea and become another product. And also our oyster reefs help with stabilize our shorelines. This is becoming increasingly important as climate change and sea level rise is affecting our shoreline. Um, since I've been farming down in the Gulf of Mexico, I've um, survived about five different tropical storms as well as hurricanes, including major hurricanes. And I can see that even my farming equipment helps with this and helps with the habitat. And of course, I'm putting millions of oysters into the water. So helping with the clarification of the water and the filtering of the water as well. So right now, another reason this has become such a big aspect of our lives is that aquaculture is a sustainable food source where you don't take from the wild when you're doing aquaculture. We buy our seed, which is what we call baby oysters, um, and put them, add them to the environment, add them into the water. And so we're not taking wild oysters and growing them up. We're actually producing baby oysters in a hatchery situation, and I'll get into that, and then putting them into the water. So we're adding the oysters to back into the water, and we're creating habitat with our farms, and we are helping with storm surge as well. I really do believe this. I believe that we will need to move more and more to farming. What we can produce farming oysters is far safer for the product itself is a safer product as well as what we're doing for the environment and doing sustainable aquaculture. So I like this quote from Jacques Cousteau, we must start using the sea as farmers instead of hunters. That is what civilization is all about, farming, replacing hunting. And I just believe in that quite a bit. So I said I was going to talk to you a little bit about um, how we actually get our oyster seed and start growing things in the aquaculture world. Um, I've I learned all of this while I was taking a class at the Tallahassee Community College Wakulla Environmental Institute. I was um, invited to be one of the first 10 people in that class to learn about oyster aquaculture and to launch the program here in Florida. Up until 2015, we 
in Florida had a permit only to be able to use the bottom six inches of sovereign submerged land in the state of Florida. So we changed the permit, worked on that to allow for the use of the entire water column. And that is what opened up um, Florida to aquaculture, oyster aquaculture. Other states have been doing this for quite a long while, but Florida was kind of behind the scenes. In 1993, they had started the clam farming, but all of that was just using the bottom six inches of the water. So this opened up the water column to aquaculture where we could start doing that. And hatcheries started opening up. Now an oyster by valve is, um, there's both a male and a female oyster. And believe it or not, they actually can switch back and forth during their lifespan. But um, once they spawn, the male and female, and find each other, the sperm and egg within the water column, um, a little baby oyster is formed that has some cilia on it. You can see this in the top left corner. That's a picture magnified. Um, they are in completely microscopic, but they do have a little cilia and can move a little bit in the water column. Um, obviously they're moved around by the tide and, and currents that are in the water, but they're out there moving until they form, and this is a picture of an oyster that has extruded a petilever, it's called, it's a foot. And on the end of this foot would be some sticky substance. And this is where it's important that it finds another oyster shell or your dock or the bottom of your boat that you've left in the water, but it has to find something hard to stick to. If it falls into the mud on the bottom of the gulf, it would literally suffocate. And so this is why it's important that we have the shell down there. And this is how oyster bars form, is that this oyster will stick to another oyster and form this almost like a concrete wall if you've been. So once this has adhered to it, uh, another oyster shell, this oyster will absorb that petilever back into its body and it is then stuck there for the rest of its life. So these are all baby oysters. This is um, what we as oyster farmers buy, these little teeny tiny oysters that have come from the hatchery. So this next slide is just sort of the life cycle of the oyster and I wanna show that. So the oysters are spawning and release their sperm and egg, fertilized egg results. And then they have, this is the velliger the, with the cilia that I mentioned. So this is like within 24 hours, they actually can see the top and bottom shell, the bivalve itself. Then the petilever comes out. And once, when this stage is happening inside the hatchery, that they will tumble these microscopic oysters with microscopic little grains of oyster shell so that each one attaches to a little piece of shell. And that's how we as oyster farmers get individual oysters rather than a cluster like what you would find out in the wild. And that's called setting. And then those little babies are sold to us and they're sold to us by the thousand and we grow them in cages and, and aquaculture equipment, which I'll start to show you as well. Okay, I don't know if anybody has any questions on that, but we'll get them at the end. Okay, so um, in the wild, um, you know, these are out there just sort of randomly floating around. Somebody could come along and eat these baby oysters until they get set. Something else can eat them once they do get set but they are starting to consume phytoplankton right from the get-go. In a hatchery, they're actually being fed a mixture of algae that the hatchery produces. A wild oyster reaches adulthood, which its maximum um, ability to reproduce at about age three. And that's also when they are about three inches long. And a wild oyster can only be sold at three inches or more, and that is to allow them to be out there during their mature stage so they can reproduce amply to resupply the population. 
So they're growing about an inch a year. This is a shell with some baby, baby oysters attached to it. So you can see how they are. Now this is a hatchery situation and these great big vats that are in the upper left-hand corner, this is where they go right after conception, right after they are fertilized, they go into these vats. And these hatchery people change the water out of these huge vats every three days and they're in there for two weeks. So they'll strain the oysters out into these very, very fine mesh netting and change the water and of course allow the feed to be put into that and that's a specialized mixture that they've concocted of algae that they're growing in their labs as well. Once they've been tossed with the shell, they're going into upwellers and then downwellers. And if they are, and they are typically close to a water source, a Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic, they will actually feed the water from those water bodies into them so that they're not having to mix the algae mixture when they get into the second and third stage of the hatchery. And they grow them up there and sell them to us by the thousand. And we buy them um, by size. And so it's all done by centimeters. And typically the smallest size you can buy is a three centimeter oyster. Um, I typically go up to the six, I'm sorry, six millimeter um, oyster seed because of the size of my equipment. Anything smaller than that would fall through the holes in my equipment that I have. So I go to a retains on a six millimeter screen. So they literally will shake the oysters on a screen and anything that falls through is too small for my purchase, but those that stay are the ones that I would buy. So this is where we are, as I said, breeding the oysters in a hatchery situation, raising them up till they're about six millimeters in size and then selling them. So we're not taking from the wild, we're adding these oysters out into the Gulf. So here in Florida, oyster aquaculture is very regulated and you can be thankful for that because that's what gives you a very healthy oyster and also um, one that has been cared for properly. But there are a lot of different agencies in, involved in doing this and the training that we receive as farmers and harvesters and processors and how we handle your oyster. So it starts with the um, Department of Environmental Protection and the Department of Agriculture basically looking for areas that would be appropriate for aquaculture farms. And that includes areas that are um, free of other wild oyster reefs, free from seagrass beds, because they don't want a lot of activity over a healthy seagrass bed. And within uh, it, further than 250 feet from a land mass, including islands, so that we're not intruding upon that property. We also are not allowed to have aquaculture farms in known channels um, and you know markers that have been made for other boat traffic. So they kind of go out and determine where this would be best to happen. And, um, and then we have to have that area approved by the governor and cabinet and surveyed professionally and marked professionally by the surveyor. And the Coast Guard, puts up navigational, we're on the Coast Guard marine charts so that any boater would be able to see that there's an aquaculture use farm in that area. And then all the permits have to be issued from the National Fisheries Service to make sure that there's no negative impact upon any kind of endangered species. The Army Corps of Engineers gets involved because of course we have a physical structure in the water and so they want to get their two cents in. I mentioned the Coast Guard and then also the actual division of aquaculture which sits underneath the Department of Agriculture. Then as a farmer I have to get training on um, farming and harvesting and tagging my oysters and then as a processor which I also am I get inspected by the Department of agriculture division of aquaculture for my processing operation and how I handle the refrigeration of the of the oyster. So it's kind of it's pretty regulated but 
all that's a good thing. I wanted to show you, for those of you who are local, where my farm is. Um, you're probably familiar with the St. Mark's Wildlife Refuge, which is over in this area. The lighthouse is right here. And um, so that's all St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge. And this that continues around here. All this is St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge as well, with a few inholdings of private property. But um, a lot of people don't know that this is all protected as well some really pretty hiking areas in here. You might have visited the Spring Creek restaurant. It's now been closed. It was destroyed during Hurricane Michael, but that's one notable landmark. Shell Point, which of course, some a little community that's here with a little beach. And this is a little community called Oyster Bay right here. And this is where I keep my boat and equipment. And my lease is in Oyster Bay, right at this location. I'm close to a beautiful little island called Piney Island that's completely undeveloped. Um, Panacea is over here. And so this is 98. And if you were to go straight north, you'd run into Tallahassee from my lease. So um, I just wanted to show you all of these markings are existing oyster bars. None of the oyster bars in this area are really in very good condition. They're not that healthy. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what we did back in 2015 is we worked with the Department of Aquaculture to set up this. This is a blow up of where my lease is in Oyster Bay to set up 50 leases in this area and have them approved by the governor and cabinet and have them certified and surveyed. And so I rent one of these leases from the state of Florida. It's sovereign submerged land. And then of course there are all these other farmers in there. We are required by the state to plant a minimum of 105,000 oysters a year and prove that we have purchased 105,000 seed minimum. You can handle millions of oysters on each one of these leases, but that's the minimum so that they know that you're actually actively using this lease and um, producing a product for the for, for consumption. Um, the state of the the Wakala Environmental I'm oh, sorry the Wakala Environmental Institute also has a research lease down here that they use to train the students that they've had in their oyster aquaculture class, and those are down here. Okay. Next. This is how I started. Um, this was the first equipment that I got. It's called the Australian Long Line System, and it's developed by a company named SEPA. And I loved this equipment, but it was not appropriate for the lease that the state assigned to me. Um, each one of these bags has oysters in it and the bags vary in size, the whole size. You can see this one's a little larger depending on the age of the oysters. But we had to set these PVC poles into um, the ground and on the bottom of Oyster Bay there's a layer of limestone that's about 18 inches to two feet down, which meant we really couldn't pound these poles in any deeper than that. And at high tide, the water was, well, I'll show you. The water was high and we couldn't get the cages up out of the water. And you actually need to get the cages out of the water occasionally to help keep your oysters clean. But, um, so we started with this and, and there's my hubby. We used to have cocktail hour assembling hundreds of these cages, hundreds of them, sitting on the back porch, just making cages day after day, starting the whole process of pulling those together because they came unassembled. Gathering up all of my equipment and then getting it out on the water. Now this was a low tide moment where we can actually get in the water and manage the oysters in those baskets and take care of them. Um, checking them out, making sure that the density doesn't get too high so that they all can filter water and feed. And of course, most of the time they're down in the water, but we do bring them up. And one of the reasons we bring them up for 
24 hours, up to 24 hours, um, almost weekly to keep them clean of barnacles and other oysters growing on them. That's how you get that high quality premium clean oyster is by doing this process called desiccation. So when I discovered, I finally, like said, I just can't deal with this equipment on my lease. It's too deep for that. I went to this system and this system is called Oyster Grow. And how do you like my office? It's pretty nice, isn't it? I know it's a great place to work, but this system is a cage that I then put bags inside of the cage that are filled with the oysters and these large pontoons keep the oysters out of the water when I have to put them up to desiccate or I flip them over and the oysters are in the water most of the time. So those cages we pull up and I have a hook on the side of my boat that holds it till I can pull out these bags and work the oysters. And the main thing I have to do with the oysters is make sure that again their density is not too high so that they can open up and filter feed and they can all get enough feed and um, just make sure that they're staying clean and healthy in there. So that's the new floating cage oyster grow system. This system has been um, is developed in, and manufactured in Canada, and they have been using this for a long time. They have a couple different varieties of their system. Um, I use what they call the two bag system, and I use it because I can handle it alone. It's light enough. Well, it's not. It's actually not light, but it's light enough that I can pull this cage out of the water myself and tend for my oysters and myself. They have one that has six of these bags in it and the people that use that have winches and two or three guys working on the boat all the time taking care of their oysters and I just decided that it was something that I wanted to make sure that I could handle on my own. Um, I do now, so here you can see that the cage is out on the water. This is a nice drone shot somebody did for me. So you can see these cages are down in the water and then there's a couple of them that have been flipped up. And this is on my lease out in Oyster Bay in the Gulf of Mexico. And I do hire help. This is part of the reason we wanted to start this was so that we could actually revive the industry. And so there's, you know, right now my boat, one of my boats is at Porter's Marine getting fixed. I hire people that come out and help me on the lease from time to time. There's the equipment manufacturing, there's you know everything that supports the oyster industry, including the distribution of the industry. So we've actually put a lot of people to work, back to work in this oyster industry. Some of them were people that were um, doing the wild harvest and some of them have started their own farms and then I got a college student, I've got, you know, a recent graduate, different people that come and work for me. So we really have create, recreated this industry. And of course this, we have to have boats. This is my new boat. I call it the Butte because I think it's got this huge roof on it. I keep threatening, I'm gonna put like, you know, a bedroom and a bathroom up there so I could live out on my oyster farm. I think that would be a pretty fun idea. So, this is my second boat. My first boat was a 19 foot Carolina skiff. This is a 21 foot Carolina skiff with all of this apparatus that helps me carry all of my equipment out there to work on it. It's just much more efficient. It's also a bigger beast and um, very prone to being blown around in the wind, but I really do like it. Um, this is one of the pieces of equipment that we use regularly. It's a tumbler. I put my oysters into a chute and they come into this tumbler and as they are moved through this they fall through smaller holes and then larger holes and then the ones that are ready for market come out on the end. So it sorts my oysters as well as knocks off anything that's on there and helps them stay clean. So this is another big, and there's a whole company now that has started in the Panacea area that all they do is make this kind of equipment for the oyster farmers. So all another industry that's started because of this. Okay, so here we are. We're 
harvesting. This, this, I love this picture. This is one of my proudest moments. This was my very first 3000 oyster harvest. And um, I took these oysters to Apalachicola because at the time there were no processors in our Wakala area or Leon area. And so I used to have to take the morning off on a Thursday morning and drive my oysters to Apalachicola and sell them to Apalachicola because they needed more oysters. So that was my very first harvest of 3,000 oysters. And um, I was still working for the Nature Conservancy at that time. So it was like a little bit of a balance job to try to get the oysters there and still keep working at the Conservancy. And they made some concessions for me and I was just really grateful for that. Sometimes I'd take the whole day off and just spend the day in Apalachicola but then decided to open up my own processing operation, which I have in Tallahassee. Thank you, Allison Ashcroft and your family, because it's behind b, &B Sporting Goods store. And I have my refrigerator there. And that's where people come and buy oysters from me directly and where I keep them and store them right in town. So people don't have to go down to the coast to get mine. And then I also now have started selling them at the farmer's market. And this is the farmer's market on Cary Forest up on the north side of town. And so I post on Facebook when I'm going to be there at the farmer's market. And people can come by and just buy a dozen oysters if they'd like, or buy a hundred oysters, whatever. So I've started doing that as well now that I started um, having a refrigerator here in town and not having to drive to, to Apalachicola. And I also started shucking oysters um, and doing events, weddings and different parties, private parties and everything. So I've decided to get into that as well. And that's a real blast because I get to see people eating my oysters right in front of me. And that's always kind of fun. So a lot of people ask me um, about the oyster and particularly now because there's been so much talk about zinc and how it is a great um, mineral that we need to help protect us against things like COVID-19. And oysters are one of the highest concentration of zinc of anything that you can eat. But they also have, of course, they're a protein source, and they also have so many other vitamins and minerals in them because that's what they're eating. So they're processing that algae and phytoplankton and minerals from the, the water itself where they live. So they're very, very healthy food that boosts your immune system and really helps a lot. Plus they're incredibly low in calories. And so they're a great food for you to have. And I know we're not asking questions in this talk, but everybody always asks me this when I'm out in public, ask, talk, giving a presentation is that, do they, are they actually an aphrodisiac? And, um, and pretty much it's been decided that yes, they can um, trigger increased levels of sex hormones. So, you know, I'm just saying it's been proven, science. Anyway, it's been a pleasure talking to you and I do hope that you all get to enjoy some Oyster Mom oysters in the future. Just give me a call and I'll bring them into town for you. Um, we believe truly that this is the future for the oyster. Um, they have become a delicacy. People have become connoisseurs of oysters from different parts of the country and the world. You can taste the difference. Even in our area, there are three bays nearby that are farming oysters that where there, you can get farmed oysters. This is the Oyster Bay where I am. Next door to me to the west is Skipper Bay. And then farther west is Alligator Harbor. And those three oysters, as close as they are to each other in growing areas, they taste different because of the waters and the minerals that are in the soil. So you can um, find your favorite and become an oyster lover. Oysters, 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 said she. These are the finest oysters that ever you did see. I sell them free a penny, but I'll give them to you free. But I see the joy of all of oysters. And well, I thank you very much. Um, I love doing what I do. I absolutely love being out on the water. It's been a challenge. Um, but one that I have really enjoyed for the past five years. I've learned so much, not just about oysters, but about 
being an entrepreneur, um, marketing, selling oysters, taking care of equipment. Um, I never drove a boat really before I became Oyster Mom, so it really has been a steep learning curve for me. And I hope you'll follow me on Facebook. I have a Facebook page, Oyster Mom, and an Instagram page. And um, try some oysters sometime. And that's all I've got. If you all want to ask any questions, I'm here. It usually takes them a couple of minutes to get them typed or um, raise their hands, so I'll give them a few minutes. Um, we talk a little bit about what got you interested in oysters. Was it just a love of oysters or, I mean, what made you decide to become this five years ago, all of a sudden? So, um, Bob Ballard, who is the director of the Wakulla Environmental Institute, asked me to be on the advisory board for the Institute to think about what kind of nature-based jobs they could teach. Um, and give people a foundation for being hired in a nature-based job in the area. And that was because of my, my years with the Nature Conservancy that he invited me to do that. And um, of course, there were so many people that had at one time been in commercial fishing and oyster industry in our area. And that with the collapse of those, we thought oyster aquaculture, I mean, it's a huge opportunity for us here. And so working with him, um, trying to set up the program and learning all the permits that we needed, I started digging into getting the permits. And the more I dug into it, the more I thought, you know, I'd like to try this, I'd like to do this. And in the beginning, it was, we were told it was like, you know, a part-time job, really wouldn't take that much effort, it was super easy, no big deal, two days a week at most you know, nothing. And of course, none of that came true. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's a huge commitment. But um, I think part of it was the challenge. And for me, restoring the industry and putting oysters back into the water was really a big part of it. I mean, when I look at the oyster farmers that are out there now, each one of us has put millions and millions of oysters back into the water. They're doing their thing out there. The when I first went out into Oyster Bay and put the equipment out, there was nothing out there. You wouldn't see a fish, you wouldn't see a crab, you'd see nothing. Now, there are schools of fish underneath my oyster farm. There are crabs all over everything, three different species of crabs, including major stone crabs. And, you know, I'm just like, this has really done something for our bays and will continue to do something for our bays as we grow the industry in our area and expand it to other areas. So that was really it. It was like, you know, gee, would you do this, Keller? Would you help us out? And then all of a sudden I'm like, yeah, I think I could do this. I'd like to try this. <laughs> You're more adventurous than I am, that's for sure. <laughs> um, and it's a pretty nice place to be out on the water. It is, it's very nice out there. Um, right there are there, days, there are yeah. days like yesterday when it was freezing cold and I'm in yeah. the water and I'm working my cages and I was out there by myself and I was just like oh lord it is so cold and I come home and you know my poor husband I turn the heat up and I've got blankets <laughs> all over it's, it takes a while to get thawed out after you've been out there for a while but I'm okay water. oh my goodness uh, Raymond would like to know how long from seed to mature oyster before you're able to sell it? Ah, that's a good question. Well, let, hold on a second, because right here, right here, I have, can you see this? I have some, um, this is a, a July oyster seed that I got. Um, and so this is now six, seven months old, and I can just start to sell these. Now, these guys are the ones that are like, I don't know, the top of their class. I don't know, they sprinted to grow. Like kids, you know, they grow different rates. But um, this is what the restaurants consider a premium oyster size. It is um, about two and a half to three inches this way, about two inches this way, and about one inch cup. And the cup is really important because then you get nice meat in there and you get the liquor, which of course has so much flavor in an oyster. So. These are my babies that are coming out right now. They're beautiful. You see how they're just like individual and clean and 
so is their meat because they've been grown in um, they've been grown in in those cages off bottom. So when you open up a farm raised oyster, getting a bag of them. Um, when you open up a farm raised oyster, you've got a really really clean piece of meat. So I sell them in these cute little bags and um, sell them in bags of 50 or bags of 100. Uh -huh. and that's so, uh, so it's a pr the minimum I would think is about six months. <clears throat> and they grow faster in aquaculture than they do in the wild. Uh -huh. And, um, but usually it's anywhere up to about a year and a half that I'm selling them. Um, I pretty much like sold out of all my year old plus oysters over Christmas, Thanksgiving, and New Year's. So now I'm into my new babies. New babies. Uh, Karen would like to know, are you out there every day year round? So <laughs> thankfully, no. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm making a lot of noise. Um, I'm out there year round. That's a must. And I'm out there weekly. That is a must. But I am um, in the winter time. The water chills down. It's now about 54 degrees, um, and the um, algae decreases in the water. So the oysters slow their growth as well. They grow much much slower in the winter time, and um, and there's not as much spawning of other things like the barnacles and other oysters going on. So I don't have to desiccate them as often. Uh -huh. So in the winter time, it's pretty much a once a week thing. In the summertime, it is a race to keep up. They grow so fast. And I, like that bag that I have them in, I'll fill it to a quarter and I'll come back three weeks later and it will be almost full. That's how much they've expanded in size. So it's this major race and you're out there all the time, depending on how many oysters you have. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to manage my farm so that I can survive if I don't have any help, <laughs> but it really does help to have help out there doing everything. So it's year round, it's a super commitment. And um, I also, of course, am hampered by the weather. Mm -hmm. Like every other farmer in the world, if it's too windy, if there's a thunderstorm, if there's a hurricane, um, I cannot go out. And so, you know, I just have to watch the weather and plan ahead. So I'm always looking a week ahead at the weather. And then I look at the weather probably more than anybody else that I know. <laughs> and, you know, what's the situation? What's the wind? I look at, I look at the wind um, down at Shell Point my where my dock is there's a wind meter there and I can get the the wind direction and wind speed so yesterday for instance <clears throat> it was 44 degrees when I left my dock oh. um, there was very little wind but the tide was out and I almost didn't make it to my lease because the tide was so low that my boat boat motor I couldn't keep it all the way down. So there were times I literally turned off the motor, lifted it out of the water and just breezed over an existing oyster bar or something, you know, till I got to another place and put my motor down again. So all of that affects us. Uh -huh. Any more questions? Everybody's very quiet. <laughs> well, I appreciate you all coming on and joining us tonight. And um, I'm always available. So you can look me up, call me up, um, talk to me about oysters. I love it. And um, I hope you do too. Thank you for this opportunity. I, oh, absolutely. I appreciate it. And I've learned so much. Um, and I'm sure our, our attendees did too. And thank you, mom, for show, coming and joining us. Um, not my mom this time, it's uh, Keller's mom. <laughs> my mom, my mom, my mom. <laughs> It's usually my mom. So um, but thank you all for joining us. And we will be here next week um, again talking about terrorism. So um, in uh, Islamic culture and uh, what's happening in the U.S. Um, so uh, again, we appreciate it and hope to see you soon. Please stay safe, healthy, um, and all of those things. And if there's anything that Keller can do or we can do for you, just yeah, email me and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.
Night. <laughs> uh.